My name is Adam Handler, and I'm the editor of WebPixel, and I'd like to welcome you to WebPixel Live. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Alex, um, who has his um, trusty photographic assistant with him. Hello, Zena. Yeah, well, I think Zen has been in, in, in here for every time. She's always in my office when we record these, so she's normally under the desk snoring. I think that's where she wants to get back to. <laughs> I'm not cool. looking very happy to be up here. But yeah, I'd bring her up for once. Guest appearance. Um, yeah, because she never barks. You never hear her. Unlike it's a, unlike my um, lot, yeah. She's always here. Yeah, yeah, Good yeah. Guess. We've heard mine, but not seen them. Anyway, right. Uh, so one of the in, in previous episodes of WebPixel Live, Alex and I discussed lens choices for um, for a variety of different camera systems. Um, and one of the questions that's come out from those um, and has been quite widely debated on the WebPixel forums um, is the using um, 8 to 15s and, and, and obviously there are various options from Nikon and Canon um, with this range of 8 to 15 fish eyes with these with this focal length available um, and um, quite a few people have kind of suggested that um, these are a better alternative possibly than some of the lenses we suggested for crop sensor for example with the 10 to 17 Takina that we suggested so so Alex and I thought we'd revisit the issue um, and chat a little about X15s and how we use them what we do with them and and give some ideas on on, on possibly why we decided that maybe the 10 to 17 may be a better option or, or, or a good option should I say for, for crop sensor cameras um, so um, I think the first point to make um, is that the 8 15 is optically a superior lens to the Takeda 17 in both its Canon and um, Nikon options. I, would you agree with that, Alex? Would you say it's a... Optical? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's considerably more expensive. Yeah. Um, and I think I think the question becomes, uh, on a crop sensor camera, is that extra expense really worth it? But I, I think we should... I think it's important to deal with the lens as a full frame shooter's lens and yep. as a crop sensor shooter's lens, because it, it's a very different lens for the two, yep. even though it's the same piece of glass. Yep. Um, so I, I really love, like the lens. I, I'm a Nikon shooter, so I use a Nikon version of it, yep. but I really like the lens and shoot it a lot and have been shooting it in the last few days uh, as well yep. as, um, as a full frame photographer. But although it's called an 8 to 17 zoom, it very much for me is an 8 or, sorry, 8 to 15, 15. Yeah. Get, get the numbers right. <laughs> um, it, it's very much an 8 or 15 millimeter for me. And to be honest, mine is pretty much a, always a 15 millimeter. Yeah. I've actually I've my, just took my camera out of the housing. So I've actually got it as I was just shooting it the other day. So this is my 8 to 15 on, on, my, on my D850 here. And um, you can see a couple of things about this is how I shoot it. First of all, it hasn't got a zoom gear on it. And that's because I generally don't zoom it underwater, and it's it's fixed there at 15 mil, yeah. and it's also got the lens hood on it, and um, if you want to use it as an 8 to 15 or an 8 and 15 underwater, you need that lens hood off. So I dive it that way really for two reasons. First of all, I'm not very interested in the circular fish I look. Yeah. There are times when I do use it, yeah. and I like having it in my bag to be able to use it, but I don't typically dive for that because to use it as an, an 8 mil on a full frame camera you need to take the lens hood off the lens which yeah. increases the amount of flare you get and this lens does flare a bit if it doesn't have the hood on yeah. and you also need to take the lens hood or the, the port hood off the the port shades off the dome port yeah. which again increases flare but also perhaps more concerningly greatly in chances increases the chances of you scratching that dome port yeah. and if you've got big expensive dome ports you don't really want to be doing that so i will take those shades off but only when I know what I'm trying to shoot. Um, I think this is this is a this is possibly a really important point to make. In the, in general, although the the zoom lenses and the eight fifteen obviously an example, of this gives you the option of going from a full circular fisheye through to a, a much less um, well full frame fisheye a full frame fisheye through to a, to a much um, to a a. Um, a much more zoomed in, much less um, barrel distorted image at the 15 mil end. Um, it really is when you go in the water, you really want to go in the water choosing to do one or the other. Um, this idea that this gives you the option of switching between the two mid dive, given that you've got to now remove port shades and 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 shades on the on the lens and everything else, tend to mean that actually you've got almost too much creative freedom, um, and it makes it hard to focus on one type of shot. So so in general, I think. Most people, if you're going to shoot circular fisheye, go in to shoot circular fisheye somewhere where there are subjects that will be good for circular fisheye, or go in to shoot 
um, more conventional fish eye. Um, and then obviously that removes the need for the zoom gear and all the other bits and pieces. Yeah, I, I think the the, re the key to good circular fish eye shots is you need that circle to show up in the final picture. So you don't want any area of shade anywhere around that circle. Yeah. So if you shoot a sort of a normal reef scene, for example, it'll often drop down to shade to black yeah. in one corner. And the problem with that is as soon as it goes to black, because the outside of the circle is black, the unexposed part of the frame, you then lose that circle effect within the picture. Yep. So they're very useful to use. I mean, I do use the circular fisheye yep. and I like having it with me, but I would say I use it in one in 50 dives. Yep. So I standardly dive it like that. Yep. Um, I think it's also important. I didn't really explain very clearly why I don't use the, the positions in between eight and 15. Yep. And that's because between at eight mil, you get a circular fisheye that completely fills the frame. Yeah. And at 15, you get a full frame fisheye view, so 180 degree corner to corner, but the whole frame filled. Yeah. In between those, you get a weird black shape around the picture, yeah. which you can take the pictures that way and crop it out or content aware fill it out in Photoshop. But the reality is you really use this lens at one end or the other. You don't use it as a full frame photographer in the middle. Yeah. So it's an either or lens. I use it, though, because as a 15 mil, it's better than the Nikon 16mm and it's better than the Sigma 15mm for me as a lens. So that's why I use it as a 15mm and it's nice that I also then am able to travel with a circular fisheye as well for free. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess we should go on to using the lens on a crop sensor camera. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me the main reason not to is that it's a lot lot more expensive than a Tekina 10 to 17mm. It's a lot bigger and I'm not convinced a lot of the time you would get those advantages back. Also, to use this lens behind a mini dome, you have to take the dome shade off, sorry, the port shade off um, on a crop sensor camera. Yeah. And as a result, it does flare a little bit more. Yeah. So the Tokina is a bit more flare resistant as well. So I think those are reasons for the Tokina. You can use the Tokina behind a mini dome more easily. You can, um, without having to take the, dome, the shade off it, it isn't quite as good as this lens, um, the Toki. Um, the Toki is, 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 is definitely not quite as good as this lens. It does have quite a lot of chromatic aberration in the corners. But I have to say that I think you'd be hard-pressed to spot the difference. The Tokina yeah. is, is very sharp, center frame. And fisheye shots tend to, because the nature of the distortion, they de-emphasize the corners anyway. So I wouldn't choose it unless I guess I was planning a full-frame upgrade in the coming days. Yeah. You know, if I was thinking, okay, I'm um, shooting Or you had both, yeah. yeah. Yeah, or you have both systems. Yeah, yeah then i definitely use it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think so, so and that's just really because I don't think it's probably about three times the cost. I haven't checked the prices. Yeah, I and so. I just don't think that that's a justifiable spend because the cost of this lens is pretty similar to the cost of a D500. Yeah. So it's a big, significant investment in terms yeah. of your overall system. So it's, those are the main reasons not to, to use it. There's no real technical reason. It's I, also, I guess one it's also, technical reason as well is that although on a crop sensor camera it becomes a true zoom yeah. in that uh, it's not got any of that cut off yeah. around the edges of the frame anywhere through its, its zoom range except when you get beyond 10 mil. Yeah. So ten or somewhere between 10 and 11 mil yeah. is where yeah. you have to stop using it on a crop sensor camera otherwise you start getting that cut off again. So you can either just zoom it really carefully and check the corners of the frame. Yeah. But I have to say when the shark's coming towards you and you zoom it out, you're not going to be checking the corners very carefully. So what I know a number of photographers have done is they, they get their zoom gear and they actually just put onto that zoom gear a blocker. Yeah. So that when the, zoom, when the zoom gear on the housing Stops. is turning that gear, it hits a blocker and can't go any further. Yeah. And it stops the lens zooming out too far. Yeah. And you can use any sort of material to create that. Anything, um, any sort of resin that you can heat up, it gets soft and put on. I know one of my friends who's a dentist used some um, the temporary filling material to put on there, which is nice. And soft <laughs> on the teeth, on. yeah. It goes, it goes hard. Yeah. And then um, when, when she zooms her lens, it stops at the right point. Um, and, and that's a good way of getting around that problem, the fact that you – that stops you then zooming it to zoom lens and the ends you don't want. So I'm just going to pick up on that point because I think it's mm. important because um, effectively, although this is an 8 to 15 zoom on full frame, on crop sensor cameras, it's actually more like an 11 to 15. Um, and so 
possibly again one of the advantages of the Takina is that the Tembal end I'm less concerned about, but that kind of extra couple of millimeters, the 17 mil end of the Takina, actually is a really nice focal length for, for particularly for bigger bigger fish, um, um, mm. bigger creatures, and bigger subjects photographically. And although the 15 mil on the Takina gets most of it, I'm not convinced that the Takina at 17 mil doesn't do a better job. Um, uh, uh, if we ignore, I would say, I think the image quality is better on the mm. Nikon, but the, the actual focal length, I think, is slightly superior. So, yeah, yeah. And then I think the final thing we should discuss in this one is is the teleconverter question. Yeah. Um, this comes up for, for both crop sense and full-frame photographers, but a, a lot of full-frame photographers say, well, if I put a teleconverter on this, uh, say a 1.4 um, Kenko teleconverter, which will work with this lens yeah. on both Nikon or Canon or Sony. We didn't mention that yeah. a lot of Sony users also use this lens on a Metabones converter. Metabones, yeah. um, if you put the teleconverter on, actually then you've got a pretty comparable focal range to using the lens as a crop sensor shooter. Yeah. But generally I would say my, my feeling about image quality becomes quite compromised. Yeah. Now, if you're not worried about ultimate image quality, fine. You know, if you're if you're a competition photographer and you just want to get the shot exactly right in camera and you can't crop it because of the competition, then that might be a really good solution. Mm. But for ultimate image quality, I think with something like a D850 like this, mm. I think my file will be better shot with the lens without the teleconverter and cropped to be the right size than it would be to 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 actually zoom the lens in with it with the with the Kenko teleconverter. Yeah. That said, I haven't done the test on that, but I don't feel it's that worth it. And if I wanted that zoom range as a full frame camera shooter, having invested in a D850, I'd go much more down the WACP route because I think that's a much better route into that, that flexibility without compromising image quality at all. Yeah. So I, that, that doesn't appeal to me that much. That said, I have used this with a teleconverter yeah. and I use it really as a wide angle macro accessory. So yeah. when I use this as a teleconverter, I'll put the teleconverter behind this lens. I'll take the dome shade off and then use it with a mini dome. And so the lens is very close to the mini dome. Optically, it's a bit compromised in that setup, but it gives me really nice subject magnification, allows me to shoot wide angle macro shots very close. I'll, um, this picture here I'll just pull up is a photo of a frogfish in a little bit of a reef scene. It's not the closest shot I took to, yeah. of it, but this was um, the, my favorite shot. I think I particularly like the fish in the background and just the balance of showing how the frogfish is living in this habitat yep. but i use it for this type of photography or closer in types of photography yep. um it's, it's a nice solution for that on as on a full frame body yep. um i'd actually would like a zoom gear for my camera that worked with a teleconverter yep. i'm not interested in zooming the lens without the teleconverter and i've got a zoom gear for that but i don't have a a zoom gear that works over the teleconverter on my system at the moment yep. and it's re they're relatively easy to make you just have to make them a little bit wider at the back so yeah, that, this this is one actually it's with the Takina 1017 and the kenko but that's, a, oh, okay. that's with that, a, that is that's the zoom yeah. gear that does it with this this combination yes so it's the same thing for, for the nikon yeah 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 so i would say overall i um i love the lens as a full frame photographer, I think it's the fisheye you should go for, yeah. unless you have access to something like an Econos 13 mil. Yeah. Um, and, and, and even so, um, I think you should think very carefully about which one's more usable to you, as we've discussed before. As a crop sensor photographer, I don't think the viable unless you feel there's a full frame upgrade in your future. Yeah. Um, I did read a rumor, I don't know, you might know more about this than me, that actually Nikon are planning to make a a Z version of this lens. I haven't heard that rumor, no. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's just me thinking. Not that I'm a big Z shooter. So if, you, if your future is an upgrade to a mirrorless camera, you may well find that buying this lens as a crop sensor photographer thinking, well, I might upgrade to a Z in the future. This will work on the adapter on the Z, yeah. but I, I was thinking there might be a... I think that, um, that, that's, a, a, that's a very salient a point. In, in the, you know, I think we, we do have to bear in mind that this idea of upgrading, at some point, it's very likely we're all going to be forced into upgrading to mirrorless full frame rather than a, um, an SLR full frame. So, so uh, you know, again, if you're, if you're rushing along going for the X50 is because you plan to upgrade to full frame, it might be worth just keeping your powder dry for the moment and going for the cheaper option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, although this lens will work on a Z. Nikon, for example, and a Takina wouldn't, yeah, true, yeah. because a Takina isn't 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 
AFS in Nikon Speed. So I guess you probably um, have no choice, really. I suppose, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Alex. I think I hope that provides some more clarity for um, those of you that, that um, are considering buying for Shiza and obviously clarifying some of the comments we made in our previous lens selection videos. Um, Alex has a bunch of video uh, pictures using the X15. I'm sure you can find them on his website or on Instagram. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you can search. You can search for lenses on my website. There you go. But you have to search with the focal length numbers. And one of the problems of searching with the focal length numbers is that also the low numbers can also be days of the month. Yeah. So you, you'll get, you know, if you shoot, if you just type in eight, you'll get everything taken on the eighth. Yeah. So it's best to type in 8.0 and that should bring up all the eight to 15 pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a problem with 105 mil macro. So yeah, perfect. No. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you all for watching this episode. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsor, which is Inon, um, or Inon if we're in America. Um, and um, please subscribe to the channel if you're interested in finding out when we release episodes in future. Um, please like this video, assuming you enjoyed it. And feel free to add comments about any suggestions for future topics in the comment section below. Thank you very much. We'll see you again soon.